This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 392, Public Speaking. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about public speaking with Marjorie Freeman and Amy June Heinlein. Marjorie is the community manager for Enable Architect. She has a diverse background ranging in digital design and creative writing. She hopes to further develop her creative background by using her role as community manager to become a better writer, build up her technical skills, and become more active in the community she loves. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Also joining us again is Amy June. She is the senior community manager for opensource.com, part of the Red Hat digital community team. She is the Discover Drupal and Drupal Core mentor and serves on the community working groups, community health team, and helps organize several of the best Drupal camps around, including being a, being a track lead for open web and community for DrupalCon Europe. CFPs are currently open. And in her off time, she enjoys punk rock shows and embarrassing her adult children by carrying around her Aaron Winborn Award. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. I'm Nick Laugham, founder at Lightning Development, and today my co-hosts are joining us for the next four weeks, Kat Shaw, senior front-end developer at Lullabot. Kat has been in web development for over 20 years and is a huge KC Chiefs and Jayhawks fan. She specializes in accessibility since 2005 and lives in Perry, Kansas with her husband, three kids, and two pets. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, also joining us, as usual, John Picozzi, Solution Architect at EPAM. Hello, everyone. That's all I got. <laughs> and now for our module of the week, Martin is traveling. So we're going to bring in Stephen Cross, co-founder of Talking Drupal. If there ever was an imposter syndrome, <laughs> this is it right now. So Martin, I hope I... Uh, fill your seat well. So I wanted to bring up a module of the week, just a very small module that is super helpful. It's environment indicator. Have you guys used it? Raise your hands. Okay. We got, we got uh, a couple here. So environment indicator is like, if you picture yourself with multiple environments, so you have a local environment for devs, you have stage in dev and production for content admins. And this module gives you a visual indicator of which environment someone's in. So you could set like the background menu bar color for production to be red, stage to be blue, and local to be green or whatever colors you want. It gives someone a real quick visual indicator of what environment they're in, which is really important when people are making content changes, config changes, they get a sense of where they are. And if someone's in the wrong space, they have a visual clue that they're in the wrong space. Super simple module. Um, it started in the first release, I think is Drupal 6. Uh, it also has a current release in Drupal 7 and it supports 9 and 10. Um, there's about 9,000 sites that are currently using the uh, Drupal 9 version of it. Uh, so, so that's the module of the week. I, I got, I, feel like I got a question. I got a yeah. question right off the bat. Sorry. Does it store that information in the database or is it stored in config and would you need config. config split? So you need config split to set it per environment or yeah, setting of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For setting. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think in, if you look in the readme, I think they recommend putting in a setting file, but yeah, it's, it's a config. You can also do other things with it too. Like you can, I think you can name the environments too and you can have it like handle language and stuff. I, I haven't used it too often since Drupal 7. I need to start getting back in the habit of uh, of, of using that. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 one of those it's one of those modules that's a super small thing, but it's really important. I, I find it more useful for content editors than for developers. Uh, just to make sure when they're, you know, testing things in stage versus production, they get a visual clue of where they are. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I was going to say, I think it's most helpful for developers when you're debugging stuff across environments to make sure you don't accidentally delete the thing on production. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, like yeah you when, you, when, you have, when you have multiple tabs open and you're looking at different spaces, this is a great way to like let you know where you are versus just looking closely at the URL. 
Yep. Yeah, I was going to say that it feels like a good addition, especially if you're using config split. So that way you know which config is actually imported. Because like if you if you're if it's in a split, like you would have that split loaded as far as as far as the you know as that. So uh, could be an indicator uh, for that as well. Yeah, good point. I, I've actually found it to be really helpful during development because it's actually helped me like oh wait I'm on this site <laughs> <laughs> at times. So yeah, I've actually found it very helpful. Oh wait, don't delete that content. <laughs> That's always my favorite. Like, oh, I just deleted that on production. Uh -oh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Stephen. And now on to our primary topic. Uh, so let's uh, let's start with you, Marjorie. Maybe what? And start with an easy question: Why is public speaking import an important topic? Um, it's important because you never know when you're going to need to use it. I, um, I, I took it out of my bio, but I was in merchandising before I got into tech. I was a restaurant supervisor and, um, there really is no overlap between what I did then and what I do now, but I didn't know that this job would require me to talk in front of people when I started it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I met Amy June and she became my mentor and, I'm glad that I know how to public speak now because I do it every week um, in some form or fashion. So I think, um, yeah, you just you just never know when you're going to need it. And I, though I'm a shyer person, um, I think it makes me more comfortable in situations where I do need to advocate for myself or talk about something that I enjoy doing. Um, I just feel like it makes communication a lot easier. So no, I want to I want to tag on to that a little bit. Um, it can be a really important aspect of sharing knowledge because not everyone can read a blog article and make the most sense out of it. Um, and then from an inclusion perspective, um, public speakers can be seen as role models in their communities. Um, one of the ways which helps we all know this makes our Drupal project better is when we have more voices. And when we see more voices on stage that look like ours, it makes us want to join that space. Um, so if we have like marginalized or excluded communities talk on stage, that really helps others want to be a part of our project and feel included. I think it's interesting. Um, well, I thought that whole, whole sentence was, or whole point was interesting, but like, I never actually thought of public speaking and its importance in relation to like different learning styles, right? Because like, I'm very much like, I read things. I don't really like our listeners know that I do not love to read, right? Um, side note, I've ordered two books listeners and we'll see how long it takes me to read them. Um, but uh, I think, you know, making that correlation of like, hey, you know, public speaking is important because it's another way people can learn something from you is like, is, is really a, a great one. So Looking at public speaking, we've established why it's important. I think we all we have done some public speaking in our in our past at, at one point or another. We all feel like it is important. But um, there's like, you know, a lot of people are afraid of public speaking. Um, and I was wondering if uh, maybe Amy June, you can go first. You can kind of explain like some of the things you've seen as to why people are afraid of public speaking. Well, we do a public speaking workshop. And one of the first things we say is how, you know, way back in like more primitive days, if there were more than five set of eyes looking at you, that meant you were in danger. And so that's sort of one of those like hmm. instinctual things is, you know, that fear that comes with people from looking at you. But there's, um, there's always, I think, for me, and I can't speak to everyone, but there's this real fear of being judged you know, fear of how am I speaking? Am I, am I speaking to the topic well enough? You know, am I qualified to speak? Um, and then depending on who is in the audience, like, oh my gosh, my boss is in the audience or someone I really respect is in the audience. And that can go both ways, like being afraid that they're there or being comforted that they're there. But um, a lot of it, I think, comes from imposter syndrome, which I'm sure you'll ask about later. Yeah, I I 
agree with that. I always, I always, or at least early on when speaking on a, on you know, a topic and, you know, one of my first times and maybe like up until, I mean, it, it happens to me even today. Like there's always that like fear in the back of my head that like somebody's going to stand up and be like, Hey man, you're full of, you know what? And I'm just going to be like, yeah, maybe I am. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. Like you might know more about this topic than I do. Um, Marjorie, have you heard anything different from folks as far as like being afraid of public speaking and, and kind of what, you know, propels, propels that? No, that sounds, I mean, from the workshops we've had, our participants say the same thing, like just, you know, feeling like they might not belong or somebody's going to ask a question that they don't know how to answer. And I know from, from, for myself being in, a technical space and only being like three years in, it definitely is intimidating to be giving a talk on, I mean, I'm not going to be talking about anything super technical, but being in a room full of people who have been in the industry for so long. And I, you know, you just kind of have to remember that I'm here for a reason. My talk got accepted. So let me do my best. But um, I would say for me, in addition to how people may perceive me in the audience, I'm scared of myself too. Like my voice shaking or my voice getting dry and it cracking. And so I I think there's like two, two worries like at play, like how is someone looking at me? And then also like, how am I coming off? You know, are my eyes twitching? You get really bad bubble guts before I present. Like there's just so much that comes with it. And I think that's what makes it really intimidating. So and I, th- I think vulnerability is yes. a good word to use in this space. Yep. Yeah. I was just going to, um, uh, to your point, Marjorie, before I, I spoke at um, Florida Drupal camp um, last month, uh, my five-year-old gave me some sage advice. He was like, daddy, when you're up there, make sure you speak clearly and don't pee your pants. And like, <laughs> I'm like, right on dude okay i will do my best not to do those things um and thankfully i did not do that but like that's i kind of i kind of know what you feel like you get up there and you're like oh this is a little nerve-wracking but then hopefully you kind of get into your flow and you're you're okay exactly and use the bathroom beforehand (laughs) and i i think that um you know everybody has a certain sense of uh of feeling embarrassed no matter how many times they have talked and has maybe a lack of confidence. And so I think that, um, you know, for me in the past and present, <laughs> um, I think that um, having my expectations of what I think I might know about a subject, not matching what the audience's expectations of what I know is the biggest um thing that makes me nervous about speaking in front of people. And so um, I know like my daughter who's 12 has always talked about that she's afraid of being embarrassed in front of people she speaks um, in front of and being laughed at. I think that's a big thing or just looking stupid, you know, and I think that that's the same, that's the same for adults um, as it is for children. I mean, we always feel that way, I think, Um, except for the exclusive few. (laughs) Kat, that's a a really good point, especially about like your experience may be different than someone in the audience. Because a lot of times I find with myself, the way I learn is different. So like, even if I were talking about drawing, which I love to do, I taught myself everything that I know how to do in Adobe. Whereas somebody with more like formalized training might say, oh, you know, you're not doing that right or, or something like that. And I might feel like I don't belong there because I didn't learn that skill in the same way that you did. And that can be an embarrassing feeling, but yeah, I, I can definitely relate to that. Also education, you know, I, I'm a self-taught web developer, um, but I hear um, even like coworkers or friends or just people in um, when I go to a camp or a conference talking about, their, you know, their education, which I think is an amazing thing. And I, I want to continue my education. Um, but that's definitely something that is, makes me feel a little bit less confident um, when it comes to 
um, not having that formal education that other people have. But at the same time, I just got to think, well, it's pretty cool that I was self-taught, you know, but I think that there's always those kinds of things that will contribute to your kind of imposter syndrome, you know. Um, so I had some tips on um, what are some tips for people to overcome that fear. Um, for me, um, there's a lot of things. Um, I think making an outline is a, is a key thing when you're going to make have a talk. Um, I think practicing with a video um, on your own computer um, is really important and with friends and coworkers. Um, I know for me, I signed up with um, talks in smaller groups like meetups and local users groups um, to build up confidence to be able to speak to larger groups. And that was really, really helpful. Um, and I know for me, studying up on the subject to build my confidence um, and maybe have it more focused was also very helpful. Um, and slowing down is a big thing. You know, I have a tendency to get nervous and speed up when I talk and trying to just slow down and take my time and and um, yeah. be more clear for me. Um, what about others? Are there some other ideas from, other, from you? I agree with the practice part. Um, practicing, you know, that way the first time you're giving the talk, it's not new words coming out of your mouth. Um, you have some sort of, uh, you know, either audio memory of what you said or just the memory of having what you said. And then um, I depending on who it is, I like to have someone I trust watching in the crowd. That way I have at least one person because there's always that fear that no one will show up. So if you bring someone, there's that one person. Um, and that's kind of nice to have that one person as like that, that person that you can look to, um, you know, when you're looking around the room, the person that's smiling at you and it's kind of giving you that boost of you're doing a great job. My first presentation was at Triple Camp Asheville last year and Amy June came and um, there was that awkward silence at the end where nobody was asking any questions. <laughs> and so she jumped in and it definitely um, made it a more comfortable and, you know, environment because you're always worried like people weren't interested. They're not asking questions. But um I already knew that I had done the prep work before and I did what I needed to do, but it is always nice to have like a friendly face in the audience to lighten things up. Yeah. I, th I, I think I got a few things. I heard something recently and it, I don't know if it really helps people or not, but I, I've heard that if you tell yourself beforehand, like you're not nervous, you're just excited. It kind of reframes because the excitement feelings and nervous feelings are like similar. So if you start to reframe it, it helps. Um, for me, the key thing is practice as well. If I if I run through a talk a couple of times beforehand, that'll help. Um, also, part of it is just getting started. Like, I'm always nervous for the first few minutes. <laughs> like, no matter what, no matter how prepared or how well I know the thing or whatever, like, I'm always nervous for the first few minutes. And I've learned, like, as long as I get through the, those first few minutes, I'll be okay. Um, another thing that's helped... Um, and again, your mileage may vary because everybody's different. But another thing that's helped is seeing the recordings because, you know, a lot of Drupal camps record them, but seeing recordings after and being like, wow, I felt really nervous at that point, but I didn't sound nervous is like, oh, I, you know, the way that I feel isn't necessarily coming across or it feels worse than it is helps, you know, helps me calm down a bit and realize that even if I'm feeling a little nervous, I, and it's also, it's okay to be nervous here. You're talking for a bunch of yeah, people. Yeah, it's, it's natural, so, right? Like it's, you, you, you should have some nervousness when you're getting on the stage to yeah. talk to a group of people, you know? Um, it's interesting. I think you all raised really, really interesting points. And like, I, I, I think I've done one or many of, of what you suggested. One thing I, I like to do, and this is totally like more of a headspace thing, I think is like, before I, before I get ready for, before I, like, even on the stage, before I, like a, a talk starts, like the Superman pose, like just putting your hand on your hand on your sides. Like literally if you watch Grey's Anatomy, like that, that's a thing like, but like, it really does help you like feeling confident. Like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to rock this. Um, I think it's uh, one thing Kat said 
um, well, Kat and Marjorie both kind of said this, but um, one thing uh, about like, you know, kids and feeling like somebody's going to laugh at them, right? Like I always try to like, like tell my kids like, Hey, th that doesn't matter. Right. But like, my, my feeling is like when I I've gotten to a mindset, like I used to worry about that, like when, when I was speaking, but now I've gotten to a mindset of like, I don't know everything. Matter of fact, I like to assume that I don't know anything. Um, and like, if somebody's going to laugh at me, like, eh, whatever, at least they're getting some level of enjoyment out of what I'm saying. Right. So like, not that I, I, I just try to de devalue like that response a little bit less and think more like also, like, if I don't know something like, I'm going to be okay saying like, I don't know that. Like, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Like I can't answer that for you or I can't provide that information because I don't, I don't know it. Right. Um, so I think like those, those pieces and then the practice thing I like to practice. Well, I used to like to practice when I had a commute in the car, like by myself in the car and like, which is like, you're just talking to yourself in the car. So like nobody really knows who you're talking to. So you don't seem like, you know, you don't seem like, you know, you're having a conversation with yourself, but yeah, it was always a great, um, great place to practice uh, your talk. So it's amazing what your the, the tricks your mind can play on you when you're up there speaking, because if somebody is laughing at you, they could be laughing at something like not even related to your talk, you know? So it's just, I always tell myself, I don't know everything and just assume that everyone has good intentions. And if they don't, they're not the ones up here speaking. So, yeah. you know, just tell myself, get over it. It'll be okay. And they're probably not laughing at you. Yeah. That, that's a, that's actually a good point because one of the things, especially now at tech conferences, like people have their laptops up, they're taking notes, they're following your slides, looking at links and stuff, but, but they also have like, you know, slack up or something and somebody might've said something else. So, and it's not even that they're not paying attention to you. It's just that, you know, they're engaging in it, taking notes and they happen to also see something else. So it, yeah, it's good to, it's, it's definitely good to think, think that way. Um, now this is something that we we talked about briefly before uh, before the show I think and that's imposter syndrome. Um so if you're talking about something technical or something that you're you people might think you would be an expert in or something how do you combat imposter syndrome when putting together your talk or even um deciding to submit your talk somewhere how do you how do you get past that? I think the biggest thing with the imposter syndrome is just to realize that everybody has it. Um, I, you know, I, I work at Lullabot and when I started here, it was like, oh my gosh, like all the people I worked with, I was like geeking out a little bit. Um, but um, a couple of years ago, actually, yeah, about two, three years ago, um, we had a talk at uh, this meeting, you know, it was pretty cool. And it was about, I, I held it about imposter syndrome and I was surprised at how many of, it wasn't just like the people that were new, it was people that had been here for a long time, attended it and it said that they had imposter syndrome. Um, mm. And I, and it's maintainers of, of Drupal um, uh, modules. So it, it really is a thing that really almost everybody has and struggles with. And I think that that made me feel better realizing, okay, it's not something that I should really hide from. It's something that I should realize that everybody kind of struggles with at some point in their career. So, yeah. And, and the people and, that don't have it should have it. <laughs> <laughs> There's something that, wrong with people that don't have it, I think. <laughs> but, but you don't have to be an expert either. And that's one of the things to combat about imposter syndrome is, you know, everyone has this idea or a different idea of what an expert is, where um, you don't have to know everything about your subject, but you do know something more than someone else and that your perspective is different. So like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to give this beginner talk because everyone already knows about this, but they don't, they don't have that same lived experience of like how hard it was for me to set up a local environment. So some of those things that make me feel like an imposter can be like a learning experience for someone else. It's also interesting, Amy June, that like, that's not like, I can understand having that feeling. And I've had that feeling before myself, like, is this talk really beneficial to anybody? Right. But like, at the end of the day, that's not your call. 
it's the, you know, the selection committee's call, the organizer's call, whoever's picking that talk to present, like you can put the idea out there and like, it's on them to say whether it's, it's worthwhile or, or like something people want to hear about. Right. Um, you know, I think one of the other things that I think about when I think about imposter syndrome is like, I've talked to DribbleCon a couple of times now. I don't know if it's two or three, I can't remember, but like, I remember like the big blocker, I think for me was, uh, to submitting something to DribbleCon was one, what Amy June just talked about was like, what am I going to talk about? That's going to be relevant. But then also that idea of, um, the talk maybe not being technical enough or not being developer enough. And like the non, like the feeling that maybe non-code, the non-code contribution or the non-code topic wasn't going to be as valuable. Um, and, you know, I, my, my mindset there changed a little bit. You know, I think my first talk was probably about config management or something like that, paragraphs or something like that. I, I don't really remember. Um, but like, which is kind of like more of a, more of a technical, like content, content, uh, site building sort of topic. Right. But like, that was also a concern for me was like that, you know, it wasn't going to be viewed as valuable because of the, because it wasn't technical enough or didn't fit into some like preconceived notion of criteria that I had in my head, which I think is something that, um, you know, can bolster imposter syndrome, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes there's value in talking about something as explicitly not an expert <laughs> in the topic. Right. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, I forget which in it, I think, project browser initiative, in fact, is really valuing right now is people that aren't experts in Drupal, giving feedback on the experience of trying to find modules, right? Because we're trying to, when you're, especially when you're trying to help onboard somebody or introduce somebody to a community or a topic or something, speaking from that perspective can help people who have been in that community or in that, that topic longer, remember like, oh, those are the things that, um, a beginner might need to know or a beginner might might not even know that they don't know so those perspectives are valuable too even if you're you're you know a novice so to speak so from the speaker's point of view right and marjorie i'll let you uh i'll let you offer offer up an answer on this question i'm wondering what makes for a good public speaking experience? So like not so much looking from, well, maybe we can look at it from both sides, right? From the audience point of view and from the, the speaker's point of view. Let's take the speaker's point of view first. Like what makes for a good experience for the speaker? Um, I would say uh, admitting vulnerability. So admitting okay. maybe I might be new to this, or this is my first time, please bear with me, you know, adding a little humor, but not super self-deprecating, which I'm guilty of a lot to take, you know, the kind of take, kind of subtract from like how nervous I'm feeling when it's totally valid. So um, just being fair to yourself as a speaker and admitting that you're not perfect. And I guess from an audience standpoint, knowing that you're knowing, remembering what you're there for, and also that you're not the one on the stage, like in that vulnerable position. So cut the person some slack if like the audio goes out or I don't know, the slides aren't working. Um, yeah, just, just be nice. Just be kind to each other. I think that's it's interesting. It's interesting because I'm I'm typically like my default sense of humor is self deprecation and like it's a very it's a very fine line, right? Because like yeah. if if you know I want to be I want to be funny in my self deprecation, right? But like some people like take it to the nth degree where you're like, okay, this is like it becomes more <laughs> annoying more annoying and for the for the audience member they're like oh man like i i honestly feel uncomfortable watching this person do this because of their their level of self deprecation right yeah don't project don't project yeah. Your, yeah i i want to tack on to <clears throat> excuse me the good public speaking experience from an from the speaker's perspective um mm -hmm. so i'm disabled and I'm hard of hearing. And so for me, I get nervous ahead of time, wondering if the stage is set up for me. 
And so mm -hmm. communication with the organizers is important. Like, are there steps going up to the stage? Do I have to ask Mike Anello to hold my hand while I walk the two steps up the stage? And then also like helping me feel more prepared is a good public speaking experience of going into the room and making sure my equipment works ahead of time. Can I mm -hmm. quickly switch things around? Are my slides at the right ratio? And then same thing with the online presentations, you know, just testing out like does hop in work with this browser and that kind of stuff. So that really helps me at ease with the experiences, knowing the technology part is going to work because I'm kind of a low tech sort of person. But again, like a lot of communication with the organizers and the expectations from them and from me really helps make that experience better. It's interesting think, you say that. Uh, yeah. Because like I, I, in my head, I was like, oh, I'm such a, I, like, I'm such a jerk from like an audience standpoint because it drives me nuts. And this is so like, so minor, so bear, bear with me, but like, it drives me nuts when like your slides aren't full screen and like, you can see like tab, like browser Chrome, because like, it just feels super distracting to me. And I'm like, ah, like I always try to get to my talks like 15 minutes ahead of time to make sure that like mirroring's working perfectly and speaker notes are working perfectly. And like, because it, it definitely reduces that that nervousness at the beginning right where you're like okay everything's good to go like my clicker works like everything like i can i can like i can now just talk and not have to worry about like you know anything else sorry nick what were you gonna say yeah yeah i was just gonna say it's interesting that you bring up the kind of conference prep because i think making the public speaker or the speaker more comfortable really does lie a lot on the conference so for example um looking at it from that perspective there's a few things one give the speaker the tools to tell the audience what they should expect. Like a lot of camps will say, is this an advanced topic or a beginner topic, right? Give them some description. Um, Nerd Summit, I know, gave us um, a, a fair amount of communication beforehand. Like, you know, you have 45 minutes, you should aim to talk for 30 to 35, leave this much time for questions at the end. Um, this is, you know, giving letting them know where they're going to be speaking ahead of time. But it's yeah, a lot of a lot of making the speaker comfortable is on the the conference or like whoever's invited the speakers. And you know, on that same on that same note, like, and this is not really like, I don't know, it's more of an appreciation thing, I think, than a than like a comfort thing. But like, um, and, and this goes more along, I think, organizing uh, a conference or camp before beforehand. But like. I don't know. I, I guess maybe it also can can help to reduce imposter syndrome. But like I remember, I think it was my first DrupalCon uh, talk. I got a uh, a letter and like from the from you know whoever was chairing the like committee to to pick speakers or whoever was doing speakers speaker relations, and like it was just so nice to get that get that note and and have them like we're really glad you're here. Like it just it validated like okay like you know, maybe my imposter syndrome goes down a little bit or reduces like a little bit of anxiety because like, you know, they acknowledge that like, thank you for submitting this. Like, we're so glad you're here. And it like, you know, it reduced, you reduced that anxiety a little bit for me. I, I know for me, um, I actually had a bad experience at Drupalcorn a few years back where I, I got there early, 15 minutes early. And my, my uh, presentation appeared on the next next door and their presentation appeared on mine and it was it was the most stressful scary moment ever and it was on accessibility testing so i was trying i had to demo them and show them everything and it's like well you know this is this and i would show you but i can't <laughs> and i was going through it and i was just like winging it and um, you know, I did the best I could, but I, t I, I don't know if I've ever been that stressed during a talk ever. Um, and, but some people still remember that talk, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> to this day. So, you know, I guess you do what you can and there's sometimes stuff like that happens and, and you, you just got to go with it and just try to find the humor in it. And that's about it. <laughs> yep. So, um, so what are some, um, never do's? when uh, public speaking, Amy June, what do you think? Well, I like to frame things in a positive note. So there's some important do's, um, like making sure that your slide decks are accessible to people, you know, like we talk about web accessibility, making sure that our 
um, our slides are accessible and that we share them ahead of time. That way people have access to the links. Um, and something that I like to do is I like to feel, I like to include the audience. And so looking around the room, even if you don't like look directly at people, but do a scan, people feel included. And then I'm always making sure that people can hear me. Can people in the back of the room see the slides? And so I change those dotes into do's, you know, making sure that I, that onus is on me rather than the audience is like, um, you know, um, but most importantly, I think, you know, making sure that you're being inclusive to the, to the audience as well as them being inclusive to you. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. And, you know, I think don't try to answer every question. Um, John was talking about this um, earlier, you know, be willing to say, I don't know. Um, I, I think when I first started out, I felt like I had to answer every single question. And I felt like uh, if I didn't, um, hmm. then they would think I was not smart enough. So I think being able to say, I, you know, I don't know that. But you know what? Give me your information and I will go try to find that answer for you um, was actually a, a really great way to get to know the people that were in the audience. So, Or you or you can yeah. take that question and ask it back to the audience. Like, I don't know the answer. Does someone else know yeah. the answer? You know, yeah. um, I also, I also like on that same thread, I also like to refer them somewhere else sometimes. Like so if I know, like, for example, uh, you know. I don't know, there's some, you know, PHP Stan question, right? Like I might say, hey, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but I know Mac Laman is gonna know the answer. Like ping him on Slack or like he's over at, you know, he's at, over in this area at DrupalCon, you can go talk to him. Like I'd be happy to introduce you if that's, you know, if that needs to happen. Just so, you know, sometimes I think you, you could end up with in a Q and A session with like a bunch of to-dos for yourself. And like, you know, that could be, that could be stressful as well. My, my first couple of talks, people had, people would talk about what they were scared of and, you know, being a, a, a non-technical person giving a technical talk, people instilled this fear of Q&A in me that, you know, the, those programmers out there will ask you a question to throw you off guard. And so my first couple of instances of public speaking, I talked the whole way through and left <laughs> no, no room for Q&A. I'm like, oh, what? Well, we're out of time. You know, and so that's how I sort of got around that. And it's probably that maybe you shouldn't do that, but that was how I combated that, you know, part of that imposter syndrome um, and not really wanting to, to, to have the Q&A stand, um, stand between me and public speaking. Hmm. Interesting. My, my it, it's funny because one of my fears, I, I didn't think about this when we were talking about fears, but one of my fears is always finishing my slide early uh, like finishing the talk super early right <laughs> being like well i was supposed to talk for 40 minutes and here we are 10 minutes in and i'm done and so there's an awkward silence yeah. for <laughs> yeah for 30 minutes but so i always encourage people to just like interrupt and ask questions because i like that but and i always end up filling up the time and more and usually talking to people after the session but that that's interesting that you you'd have that people have the opposite um i yeah concern. i I have so much to say about it all. Well, you've had me on several times that I talk that I have to use speaker bullet points and notes to keep my talk within the 45 <laughs> minutes or I'll just like tangent all over the place. So that's a good do too, is like practice your timing for your talk. And that way you're not oh, yeah. nervous about it in the midst of, um, of, of when you're giving the talk, but that's hard because you're nervous and you go a little faster or you have to back up and repeat something you say, but that practice, 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 you know, again. So moving on from, from this a little bit to a slightly different topic, I'm, I'm curious um, who some of your favorite public speakers are. Mike Herschel in the Drupal world, um, because he's super funny. You can't always leave it on recording because sometimes he'll say something you, you can't have on Drupal TV. But I think that the way he presents information is, is really really user friendly you know he gets up there he adds some humor he has some some anecdotal stuff to go on but then the topics he chooses are really relevant to drupal too how about you marjorie this was a tough one that i i i couldn't answer because everybody that came to mind was 
was not um, like I'm new to the Drupal community. I'm new to tech. And so I was thinking about celebrities and I was like, I don't know if that's really relevant to. <laughs> sure, sure, sure it is. I mean, there's still public speakers. I mean, it doesn't have to be yeah. just Drupal. Drupal um, it's always changing for me, but I would probably say like Pedro Pascal. Um, he's right. uh, an actor and kind of also new to like his career just took off and he's done a lot on uh, Saturday Night Live recently. And um Something that comes to mind is the monologue he gave about um, his family and, you know, becoming famous and having his breakout role and stuff. And uh, he, I don't know if he's an introvert like me, but um, he just seems like, you know, over time with a lot of practice, um, he became, he grew into his craft and I just Whenever I hear him talk, I identify with him a lot. But hmm. uh, yeah, if anybody doesn't know who he is, he he plays in this new show that's based off a video game called The Last of Us. Yeah, um, yeah. isn't isn't he also, also the Mandalorian? Yes, yes. he's oh, in everything. Okay. He's also yeah, in he's in everything. He, yeah, he he like uh, was like no, you never heard of him. And then he's in everything. He's, yes, he's really good. I, I think he's I good. actually. Uh, read an article in Wired um, on my way back from DrupalCon, uh, Drupal Camp, Florida, um, about him, and that was the first time I had ever like. You've probably seen out. places, but like, oh, right. like didn't know his name because he literally just blew up overnight. Yeah. But happy for him. I, I think, um, and you know, uh, again, another Mike in the Drupal community who I think is a, a great uh, speaker, um, Mike Anello. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed his um, lightning talk at uh, Florida Drupal Camp, which was about um, bad uh, job postings on, on uh, the Drupal job board and um, just kind of like how they could be better uh, some things that annoyed him about about Drupal, which I thought was pretty pretty interesting. But in general, um, you know, I think Mike Mike comes from um, kind of an education background and has spent time in the classroom. And I think like I think that kind of translates and helps with the public speaking a little bit. I know that nothing nothing is as um, equalizing as being in front of a classroom full of uh, of students, um, really at any well, level, but. It, if and we need to, has, oh. sorry, I was just going to say, if we need to restrict our answers to people named Michael in the Drupal community, I'm going to say Mike Miles. <laughs> oh, he's good too. Yeah. yeah I want to tag on to the Mike Anello thing for a second, though, before you talk sure. about Mike Miles. What's nice about Mike Anello is he's not afraid of making mistakes. And so everything becomes a live troubleshooting episode, <laughs> which is super nice because it's like, and that kind of taught me too, because when I first started, I would give talks on how to give patches and then my patches would be empty and I'd be all nervous. But then I like thought about my Canelo and how it's just, Oh, well now let's just figure out we're going a different direction. We have to figure out what's wrong. And that's what that's nice about Mike. He has that, like just that slow groove on, okay, what can we do now to improve this that I did wrong? I haven't met Mike in person. I met him virtually for um, a, the Drupal easy course that he um instructs and it, I forgot how many people were on the call but he was just really nice and I hope to like actually work with him soon but haven't met him yet but he's a great guy <laughs> I think like in in and not to be like Drupal specific here so like looking outside of the Drupal industry like when looking at like favorite public speakers like um you know, we've had John O. Bacon on the show like he comes to mind as somebody who's like really um like just really enjoyable to watch speak, uh, whether in a video, on stage, wherever. But I also am thinking like, um, Marjorie, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned um, like Hollywood actors. And I, and I thought like, you know, like I would look back at like Oscar speeches and like look at like, because you can definitely get some really good tips from like 
from people that delivered really good Oscar speeches where you're like, okay, what did they do well here? Okay. They weren't rambly. They were like to the point, like, what did, you know, what did they not do well? What could have been better? Oh, they like tripped over their words or they didn't really have like their thoughts put together concisely. And like, you could kind of build like a montage of like, okay, these are really good Oscar speeches that like you could, you could learn from. Um, um, and on that realm, um, I watched the uh, ESPN honors for um, football players and Dak Prescott oh, yeah. gave um, an amazing yeah. speech uh, this year. It was oh, very, yeah. very moving. Yeah, I was I was really touched by that. So um, for me, my daughter's named Maya and she's named after Maya Angelou. Uh, Maya Angelou, just something about the way she speaks, her tone, her tempo, and what she puts out always um, was something that I really enjoyed um, when she spoke. Um, and I have a really big mix because I love Ricky Gervais too. So his uh, the way he speaks is just really great and funny, and he has a great sense of humor. Um, but um, personal, like who I work with, there's I work with somebody named Matt Cleave, and he's given some lightning talks to um, Lullabot, and he I'm sure he's presented. He's a back ender. And there's something about his delivery that is just so good and crisp. And it's just, I just love it. So, so he, correct me if I'm wrong, and you may or may not know this, but so he is the host of the All About podcast, but he yes. was also on radio, was he not? I would not doubt it. I'm sure he has been. And he I is feel like great. Yeah, I feel <laughs> like I got that from 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 listening to the All About podcast. Um. So speaking of speaking of radio, and I just mentioned YouTube videos and, and other things, um, Amy June, what are some alternatives to public speaking? Um, maybe not so much uh, speaking medium, but maybe like writing medium or maybe like sure. different types of things you can do to get your knowledge gonna, out there. And I'm going to make a plug here. Uh, oh, please do. Drupal Camp Asheville has a neurodiversity initiative. Um, that leaves space for people who who may be too fearful to present in front of the crowd. And so they're offering things like, you know, recording the session and then delivering it while sitting in the audience. But they also have things like submitting an article instead, because, you know, I talked about this at the beginning, not everyone learns in the same way. And so me and Marjorie both do this in the community as we encourage speakers to write their articles for the digital community sites that we have. You know, she has enable architect and I have open source.com, but it gives that those people who really, really don't want to get up in front of people, the space to share their knowledge. And then again, that opportunity to share knowledge in a different way for people who can't or don't process things the same way that other people do. And the same, I think the same things we've been talking about apply to writing too, because there are people that uh, we hear it all the time with our workshops. They feel like they, um, like, will people even care about what I what I want to write about? And it's like there is somebody out there that cares, you know. So it's I think you use the same like part of your brain to get that courage to to write as you do trying to speak and blog posts if we're talking about alternatives. Um, and, you know, actually for me, um, I've taken some blog posts and turned them into talks. So I think that that's a great opportunity for you to get something out and get some information out. And it creates a good outline for you to then take it and create a talk out of it. Amy, June, and I encourage, we actually encourage speakers to turn their talks into articles or if they've spoken about something that they're interested in, you know, writing about that, like, it's just, um, yeah, yep. it's, a, it's a good way to communicate what you're interested in. I also, yeah. um, I know that Kat mentioned maybe the first or second question, like doing meetups, hosting meetups. That's a way that I have forced myself to practice what I do at work in my personal life. I love movies. Yeah. And so I started like a a movie meetup and I've only had one. It was not the best because two people joined, <laughs> but I was still like, I was still nervous, like even talking to them, but I want to do more because it was just good practice. So I, 
not to derail Amy Jean's question, but um, meetups are a great way to practice too. That's good. So, um, so uh, Marjorie, um, when with podcasting and YouTube videos, um, is speaking in these mediums different, in your opinion? This is actually my first podcast, and I have not uh, been on any YouTube videos, but I have hosted a meetup, and I I guess I am on YouTube technically because Amy June and I's last workshop was recorded <laughs> by SF Doug and put on YouTube, but I'm new to podcasting and YouTube. So let, let me let me ask you this then. Okay. Was this less stressful than speaking in front of a group of people? Uh, yes, like now I'm comfortable, but I would say like the lead up to it, my stomach, I still had that same turny feeling and like was, I don't know. That's a great question. So I, I want to say something okay. about this podcast yeah. versus some other podcasts. This one there's a video aspect to it that y'all share. And that makes me more nervous than when I do a podcast where there's mm. no video shared. So there's a little bit of difference there for huh. me is that like public eye. That's surprising so, to me, right? Amy June, because I, I, otherwise, how would people see your Aaron Winborn award? <laughs> I, I know, I you know. Took the words I, out of my mouth. <laughs> I mean, but no, there is they, a can't, little bit of they a can't hear it, right? <laughs> But no, there is a little bit of a difference when, um, for me, like in Hopin too, uh, when I'm broadcasting and I don't see anybody, it's less nerve wracking for me than having an audience in front of me. I feel so opposite. Same. So like for me, like during the pandemic presenting in a, in a atmosphere where I can't get audience feedback was like hard because I was like, well, I don't know. Hopefully that joke was funny but they, or but they're hopefully <laughs> chatting. they're chatting and you see the well, stuff going by in the chat window. I, and well, that's interesting though, John, because like when we did the keynote at GovCon, I think if that had been in person and we were doing the keynote in front of 400 people, I would have been way more nervous. But then again, it was also kind of like we had practice obviously. And it was kind of just like the podcast with you me and Stephen talking to each other too. So that was, yeah. I mean, for us, I think it's like, this is a safe space, right? Cause we're like, and, and for all of our guests too, right? Because there is that layer of editing that can happen. Like if you're like, Oh, that was real dumb. I made a boo-boo like Nick, can you please edit that out? Yeah, sure. Let's edit it out. Right. Um, that doesn't happen um, frequently, but like it, it's, it's like a safety net. Right. As opposed to like, Hey, I'm getting up on this stage and I'm going to talk to these 300 people or 200 people or 20 people, whatever it is like that, that definitely can be, uh, can be anxiety inducing. Um, so let's shift for this next question. Um, Marjorie or Amy June, can you tell us a little bit about your writing workshop? Because that was kind of what pushed us out into talking about public speaking today. So I want to do a little plug first for the writer's workshop that it started in the WordPress community from a mm -hmm. woman named Jill Binder. Jill Binder brought it into the Drupal space. It was an initiative through the diversity and inclusion group. And um, I had this idea of this open source when I switched over into um, writing, you know, collecting writers. I was like, I'm going to take the speaker workshop and convert it into a writer's workshop. So I want to give Jill a little bit of the credit of, you know, setting up this kind of format and that's uh, the WordPress inclusion community. And what's the real question, John? Uh, sorry, <laughs> what is WordPress you're speaking of? No, I'm kidding. Uh, we all know what WordPress is. So um, the question here is just um, telling us a little bit about the writing workshop um, and, you know, how it applies to public speaking or people who want to share knowledge in general. I think Marjorie talked about this a little bit, um, was, uh, again, the writer's workshop is to, uh, it help, it helps people kind of bust through all those myths people have about writing. And then we talk a bit about, um, 
brainstorming, you know, so our writer's workshop is giving some prompts and allowing people to brainstorm and collaborate with each other. And then we really, we really don't give too many guidelines, but we talk about, you know, the, the, the points of, of, of writing, what makes a good technical article, you know, the intro, the body and the conclusion. And then, um, you know, we talk about suggested word counts, article types, links, and images, and we do that. But those are merely guidelines, you know, but it sort of breaks down the technical writing process into smaller chunks. So people feel more comfortable, you know, either converting their written or their spoken word presentation into a write, into a, into an article or ideas that they've had, or, hey, I've been working on this book and I want to promote it a little bit. How do people break down those larger ideas into article article chunk sizes, but a lot of it is like working through imposter syndrome, working through, you know, what can I write about? What are people going to be interested in? And Marjorie, can you tell us when it is? So the, our upcoming workshop, yep. the next one, the next one is April 13th and I'm not good with time zones for me. <laughs> it is, I, I believe it's eight. eight. 30 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. yeah, 8.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and I'm sure we can send a link. Afterwards. And that's and that's virtual through San Francisco Drupal Users Group. And then also me and Marjorie got accepted to DrupalCon. Well, we'll be giving an abbreviated workshop on nice. technical writing. And it'll be a little bit different. You know, it won't be so much brainstorming, but like kind of like, like you know, more of the skills of technical writing. And that'll be um, DrupalCon Pittsburgh. We will have links to those in the show notes. Okay. And as we get to wrap, if somebody's looking to get started in public speaking, uh, do you guys have any advice for them or resources that they should consider? Can I do this one, Marjorie? Yeah. Cause I'm still Okay. Thinking. So the WordPress community has speaker workshops almost once a month. Um, if you, there's a, there's a will be a link in the show notes, but they have speaker workshops once a month, but then, um, me and Kat have the privilege of working on a couple meetup spaces like Kat and I do ally talks and Kat coordinates speakers. We love first time speakers for accessibility talks. San Francisco Drupal users group. We love for people to um, do their first round of, of, of talks with us. But we also want to remind people that you don't have to give a 45 minute talk. You can give like a, a boff. Boff is a good way yeah. to get public speaking experience, you know, where it's like that birds of a feather at a conference or give a lightning talk or places like Drupal Camp Asheville have unconferences where you can kind of just get up and talk about whatever everyone else wants to talk about. So those are really great ways to kind of start small if you're nervous and then allows your allows that space to feel comfortable with public speaking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean definitely definitely go to a local if you're in the Drupal community, going to Drupal a, a local Drupal meetup a lot of them have lightning talks, which are like five minute segments. Um, you can also um, go to a smaller regional conference like NEDCAMP or Nerd Summit or something. You know, um, they generally have, you know, it's a good way to practice your talks, you know, if you're not ready to kind of go to DrupalCon and, you know, talk in front of a large audience. And if you're like, if you're super, super new, I would even like, I'd I sometimes challenge myself if I attend a meetup or a conference to just talk to at least a couple people in the room after. And this is, I guess, from the audience standpoint, like yeah. um, to go up and maybe introduce yourself to the speaker or just somebody else in the audience and kind of get like your your pitch for yourself down. Like, hi, I'm Marjorie. I work at Red Hat, you know, and and not, you know, spill it out like you're reading a book or anything, but just learn how to just talk to people. Uh, Cause if you're like me, basic conversation sometimes isn't like easy. <laughs> so yeah. just, just starting there, if you're starting from the, like from super scratch, but um, yeah, that's, that's a tip that I try to live by sometimes. That's a, that's a good point. Even asking a question in a talk is public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. And I know for me with the meetups, when I first started out, just work, just even showing something you're working on at work, um, some kind of new feature, starting really small, um, just to build your confidence, um, 
could be just a simple way to start speaking. And you'd be surprised at how impressed others are with some of the things you're working on. I, you may think it's something small and not not very trivial or not very interesting, but other people will be like, oh, that's really cool. So just remember that um, and just know your value, you know. Well, Marjorie and Amy June, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure having you guys on. Do you have questions or feedback? Reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or by email with show at TalkingDrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. And you can promote your Drupal community event on Talking Drupal. Learn more at TalkingDrupal.com slash TD promo. Get the Talking Drupal newsletter for show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and much more. Sign up for the newsletter at TalkingDrupal.com slash newsletter. And thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at TalkingDrupal.com and choosing Become a Patron. Well, as we close out the show, Marjorie, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, had any questions, what's the best way for them to do that? Definitely LinkedIn. Just type in, I'm pretty sure I'm one of very few Marjories in whatever area you're in. So just type in Marjorie. <laughs> I should pop up and connect. How about you? How about you, Amy June? It's Volkswagen Chick across all of the medians, V-O-L-K-S-W-A-G-E-N-C-H-I-C-K. Great. And Kat, if our listeners want to get in touch with you. Uh, same here with social media. Um, LinkedIn might be best, but it's Kat and Shaw, all one word. Uh, K-A-T-A-N-N-S-H-A-W. Awesome. And John, how about you? Uh, I am John Picozzi on all the major social networks and Drupal.org. And you can find out about EPAM at epam.com. And you can find me pretty much everywhere at Nixvan, N-I-C-X-V-A-N. If you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking.